Hello, I'm Dean McKnight, and welcome to another edition of Taking Back Our Neighborhoods, an extension of Operation Our Town. Today, we're going to talk about a really interesting subject, youth drug prevention. We've all read these articles in the paper about how young people get involved and how they, how they, you ever wonder how they get started? Well, today, we're going to talk about that with three terrific guests. And we're going to start out with Sandy Smith, who is involved with a group called Home Run Against Drugs program. That sounds like an athletic endeavor, Sandy. Well, it does have an athletic theme to it, Dean. And tell me about your role, and what do you do with, with this Home Run Against Drugs? Well, I'm a site manager for Young Readers Council. Um, we're a nonprofit organization devoted to um, promoting literacy through our give -a book programs. And Home Run Against Drugs is the one that I've chosen to focus on in this area. Wow. Literacy. Yes, it's a literacy program as well as an anti-tobacco, alcohol, and illegal drug program. So we're encouraging these young people to read, and, and, and tell me how that affects their their use of drugs. Well, the theme is home run against drugs, and actually, what I do is I have an assembly program for the second grade students in Altoona. Bellwood, Hollidaysburg, Tyrone, and Spring Cove school districts, both public and parochial schools. And as part of the program, they receive a personalized book. And I take some information, their, their names, their friends' names, their hometown and their age, and it's all interwoven into a story. So it helps to promote literacy, as well as um, reinforcing our anti-tobacco, alcohol, and illegal drug message. Wow, and, and the age group that these people are in. They're young. usually seven and eight year old students. Male and female? Yes. That's wonderful. How big are your groups? Well, uh, in some of the smaller schools, it might only be 10 students in a class. And um, probably my largest program is the Tyrone School District, where they have close to 125 second grade students. Wow, that's wonderful. And, and how did you get involved in all this? Well, um, I was an independent dealer for Create a Book, and in 2003, they... You said you were an independent dealer? I thought you were going to say I was in the drug business myself. <laughs> no, book dealer. Okay, book dealer. Um, and in 2003, they notified all of us dealers, saying that they were working with a nonprofit organization, and they wanted to know if we were interested in creating a program within our communities, and I was definitely interested. That's terrific. And and what's your total number of, what, what do you think the total number of young people you have in, this, in these programs? In a school year, it's typically about 1,350 to 1,400 second grade students. Oh, my. my. And, and you run the program yourself? Yes, I raise the money. I conduct the assembly programs, and I print and bind all of the books prior to the program. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me about raising the money. Uh, it's challenging, but um, I, I'm uh, successful in getting some small grants and a lot of sponsorships through organizations, individuals. Now, is that where Operation Our Town comes into play? Um, I haven't been successful in receiving a grant, a grant through Operation Our Town yet, but I... We need to keep asking. I, well, I hope to, uh, <laughs> to apply again in the spring. Um, but a lot of businesses are very supportive of the program. I've had a lot of the same businesses from the time that I've started. That's wonderful. Folks, you know, that's your cue. If we had more contributions, if more people would send just a few dollars each, we could help more organizations. Here's an organization that helps young people, that's doing a terrific job in our communities, and we're not doing enough to support it. Uh, tell me where the, the why does, Where's the name Home Run come from? Well, one of the founders of the program was a minor league baseball player, and uh, he felt it was important to um, to pass along the message of staying tobacco, alcohol, and drug free, to have a healthy lifestyle. So he created the program in Mobile, Alabama, and then he. Um, spoke with uh, John Hefty, who is the owner of Create a Book. He wanted to have an item that was long lasting. So they developed the personalized book called Homer and Me. 
Wow, that's wonderful. You know, we just, none of us read enough. Some people read a lot, but most of us don't read enough. We, we kind of become lazy, and, and yet we're working with these young people. To, is there any particular books, or, or they just choose their own, their own uh, uh, subject matter, whether it be sports or romance or whatever? With this program, this book was designed specifically for Home Run Against Drugs. Oh. And the best thing about this book is that it has the child's information in the story. So the book is truly about them. So and it now. Helped. So the children are uh, really excited when they see their names in the books. And it helps, again, to promote literacy by having them read the story about themselves. Well, now I'm beginning to figure this out. They don't just read any book. They read books specifically directed to helping them avoid drug abuse or drug uses. Exactly. Using. Wow, that's wonderful. And, and, you know, I guess maybe a year or two ago, I would have thought eight, nine-year-olds, come on. But we had a young gentleman on this program who said that he was approached about drugs when he was 12 years old playing sports. And I said to him, 12 years old is young, and he said, no, Dean, now it's seven and eight years old, that these young people are being induced to try different things. They don't always go by the name of marijuana or names you would recognize, but uh, it's kind of induced to do that. How, is this like a workbook? Tell me about the book itself. Well, the book is a hardback book. Oh, that's it? Yes, that I print and bind prior okay. to the program. I furnish the schools with Hold the... Hold that up so the camera... Where's our camera at now? We need to see this. Can we see this book here? There we go. Thank you. And I furnish the schools with all the order forms. Okay. The teachers help the students fill out the forms prior to the programs. So then I take the information I type it into my computer, I print out the pages, and then I incorporate them with the illustrated pages, and then the sponsor pages, and then bind the books. So I have all the books ready whenever I do my assembly program. Now, Sandy, I'm sure you must feel very good about the program or you wouldn't continue to be involved in it. Are, are there any specific examples that you have of where maybe a young person has come and said, you know, my brother did this or something? Your personal involvement with the participants. Um, one of the, the best things that I've found is um, I, I have a, a mascot in the program called Homer, and I get high school boys to be my Homers. And they're now coming around that the boys that I'm training to be Homer were actually students that were in part of the very first programs and several of them many of them have told me that they still have their personalized book that they might have received 10 years ago um, now this effort is in addition to your regular occupation am i correct yes yes i i have my own uh, small business that i do for my home which are personalized books but this really takes up most of my time. Uh, tell me a little bit about your time. Tell you, are you married? Yes, I am married, and I have one son. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and is he in that age group yet where he can participate in this group? No, he is now 24 years old, but he was one of my homers. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're only 24 years old. <laughs> you, you look very young. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. But uh, Jacob was actually one of my homers. He was one of my best homers. He even continued being homer um, through his collegiate years. And um, so I miss him. But I, I've gotten a lot of great boys uh, from Bishop Guilfoyle to be my homers. Oh, that's wonderful. And you, and you drive to all these locations and participate in all the programs? Yes, we have the assembly program. It's about an hour-long assembly program. And it's really about making healthy lifestyle choices. That's what we're going over in the program. Um, how to um, take care of their minds and bodies by eating correctly, exercising, staying in school, studying, doing their homework. Again, it's about making healthy lifestyle choices. Is this after school or is this during the school? It's during school. During the school day. Right. So the school districts actually cooperate with this and, and they're interested in seeing these children lead a, a better life also. Absolutely. The, the school districts have all been phenomenal in um, supporting the program. 
and um, I go in every fall to Bellwood, Tyrone, and Spring Cove school districts, and every spring I go to the Altoona and Hollidaysburg school districts and have a program at every elementary school, both public and parochial. Now, I must confess, I, I have never heard of the, the home run program, but I, I'm really impressed with your the depth of this thing. And, and what is there another level, or, or is that the end of it? When they they're just a program for seven or eight year olds, and then that's it. As far as my participation, yes, I do this annually for every second grade class. Um, it, I, it would be nice that if there was a follow up and subsequent grades, you know, a different type of program. How can we help you, Sandy? If you're talking to the viewers right now, how can we help you with this program? Um, well, uh, sponsorships are always welcome. And, and tell me about what a sponsorship is. The program cost is $15 per child, and sponsors are able to sponsor as many children as they would like. There are advertising opportunities in the book. All sponsors are listed in the book. And all sponsors are invited to the program as well to come and observe the program and be recognized. So if you're watching this program and, and you don't remember the, the name of, of Sandy's organization, you can call Operation Our Town and they'll give you an address and it's $15 to, to support one child right. and, and do a little bit. And I keep saying, folks, it's not about the thousands. It's about the fives and the ten dollars that people send us in and the participation that, that says, I support what you guys are doing. And that's not always easy to get, is it? No, but I've been very fortunate. I, I have a lot of uh, businesses, organizations, and individuals who have been very supportive of the program. Some of them drop off and then I pick up you new pick ones. Pick up other ones. Right. Pick up other ones. That's terrific. I you know, folks. There's so many organizations like this that are kind of like flying under the radar. I will confess, I, I have not heard of this program. Of course, I'm also not six or seven or eight years old, or maybe I would have heard about it, but doing great work. You must feel terrific about your efforts. I'm very pleased with how the program has taken off and how it has maintained its um, status, you know. Do you get any feedback from parents? Now and then I do. I do um, get a lot of feedback from the schools. I do give them an evaluation form to be filled out after every assembly program. And then I take their comments and um, use those to better the program. Wow, you know, like I said, too many programs like this under the radar. There's a lot going on in our neighborhood folks that we really don't know enough about. Maybe that's what this program can help to educate people as to organizations like yours. Sandy, what a pleasure talking to you. It was nice to I wish you the greatest Thank amount you. of success. Thank you very much. We're going to be right back in a minute with another spectacular guest. Don't go away, please. Most of the kids have a, come from homes that are somewhat dysfunctional. Uh, a lot of times they don't have a parent at home that can help them with their homework. All they see is uh, maybe the big brother who's been a drug addict. We have kids in the program actually whose uh, parents have died uh, from drug overdoses. The human cost to our community is high but drugs and crime also impact business. Think about your own family. When, I, when my family goes out to, to shop and conduct commerce within the city, I, I, or in the community in, in general, I think it's very, very important uh, that we all have that peace of mind. Welcome back. I'm joined now by a wonderful young lady, Maureen Letcher. Maureen's from the Hollidaysburg Area School District. Maureen, what do you do at the school district? And, and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm the high school principal. I've been with the school district for six years, and I've been at the senior high for two. Um, so it's, it's a, a great school district, and the students there are wonderful. That's terrific. And, and 
Tell us about the, they have it, apparently they have a drug program at the school. Yes, um, at this point our drug program is a volunteer drug program. And in about September of each year, a letter is sent home to the parent by the superintendent with the volunteer drug policy, board policy attached to it. Explaining that what happens is that if the parents and the students complete the forms saying that they will participate in this, then when they are um, assigned a number, which is put on a spreadsheet in the computer, and that's how the number is assigned, and every week at the junior high and at the senior high, uh, the nurse will just randomly pull a number, and that student will then be drug tested. Either it's a alcohol mouth swab, they'll check for alcohol, or it's a five panel urine test. So alcohol and drugs. Yeah, so we they either get one or the other. And it, the um, before the number is pulled, which one, they usually alternate back and forth, it's determined which one will be used. So that's pretty interesting. So everybody can be in the program. It's all inclusive if they mm -hmm. want to be in it. That's right. But you don't get tested every, it's kind and of like And you may never get the lottery, tested. That's but right. But the fact is you're willing to do that. Mm -hmm. Can you share participation rates, or is that kind of privileged information? No, it's not as high as you would like it to be, um, which is unfortunate because I always stress to the students and to the parents, and they do at the junior high too, that it's a great out for students. If you're at a party or um, you know, in an unfortunate situation where you might be offered something, you could just say, my parents made me sign up for this program. Because there have been times where just because it's random, where one student was chosen maybe you know, twice in a, in a month, because sure. it is a random, um, and, and like you said, the lottery system. But it can go without you even being picked. But Now, the athletic program. Is drug testing mandatory, or is that again voluntary? That's so it's voluntary. all voluntary. Yes, it's all voluntary. Boy, I just struggle with wondering why a person wouldn't say, "Yeah, yes. I'll be in this program." That's right, and we really do promote it during October, which is Red Ribbon Week. Uh, we really push it then, and students are often students that are in the program. You know, can receive some prizes and things like that. I know they do that a lot at the junior high. Looking back at my life, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right when you say sometimes we need to give young people an excuse mm -hmm. to say no. That's right. I was growing up in a neighborhood where uh, there was a, a lot of homemade uh, alcohol. It was an Italian neighborhood. They made wine. It was uh -huh. part of the heritage. And, and the young people had access to that sure. wine. And I, I, always, I always said, you know, if I go home, my parents would smell alcohol in my right. breath. I would be in big trouble. So I never had a problem with that because I had an excuse. Right. And and that's wonderful that they give people that opportunity. Uh, what what other means do they use to, to handle drug? The, the, do they sniff the? I see occasionally they they sniff lockers with dogs and things. We do. We had the dogs come into the high school last year once, and also to the junior high. Um, and that's random, you know, that the, the dogs, the drug dogs go through. Right. And if they tag a locker, then you check that locker on either locker on the on either side. You would call um, the student out of class and the student standing there. And just like with the drug testing, if your number's pulled and you're tested, then we always call the parents with the student sitting there and saying, hey, you know, this is what happened, this was the outcome, which is, you know, you, nine times out of ten, it's a, it's a negative drug test, and we always thank the parent for participating and thank the child, too, because that's huge. It really is. Um, so same thing with when we bring in um, the drug dogs. If for some reason a child's locker is searched, and we could also, they go out among the cars at the senior high, not at the junior high, obviously, because the kids aren't driving, but at the senior high, and we can also search the cars, then we would always follow up with a phone call with the child sitting there to the parent. That's wonderful, Marie. We had a law enforcement officer on this show uh, a couple months ago, and he said that uh, they've had occasions where the dogs would sniff out a locker. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it wasn't the student, it was the student's parents. Mm -hmm. And it was residue on the student's clothes from the parents' drug abuse. Boy, that's gotta be, 
I mean, you're right there in the heart of that. You've got to see things like that happen, and it's got to break your heart. Usually, <clears> if <throat> a student's using, the parent knows before we do. You know, the parents know. Because if we find out that a student's using, whether it's through drug testing or whatever means, we always call the parents because it's our obligation to let them know what we found out about their child. And the child's sitting there. You know, they know what we're telling them. Parents. Yeah. They're high school students, so I will always want them to hear what I'm saying to mom or dad or the guardians, and um, the parents usually already know. I'll tell you, the school district has an awesome responsibility, don't they? They, they do, and with the drug testing, if you come up positive in a drug test and you've signed up for the volunteer drug testing, just through that drug test, if it's positive, you're not disciplined. It is a, we want to be proactive. What can we do to help you? The only time you're disciplined is if we catch you either using or you're bringing it onto school property, um, then that way. But through the drug testing program, because we're trying to promote it, it's, it's more a mandatory counseling. You see the drug and alcohol representative that comes through the student assistance program. Um, so it's, it's that type. It's not a punitive. It's something to, to help the student. Mm -hmm. That was something I had a little bit of difficulty wrapping my mind around when, when I started to moderate the show. And I kept hearing about rehabilitation efforts and about working people back into society and, and making them whole. And I realized that uh, protecting against drugs is not just about prevention, it's about treatment. Absolutely. And about let's make this a better place and get these people back on the right track. Well, our drug and alcohol program, seeing the counselor, is mainly an educational type program. This is what you're using. This is what it can do to you. So it's more of a, a, an education. And that is, like Sandy had brought up about them starting uh, when, when second grade. And they do educate them at a very young age. And it's through the health curriculum, too, that we talk about. And we have speakers that come in. Um, on, a, on a pretty regular, you know, one or two times a year, and we'll have an all-school assembly that talk to the students about the, you know, drugs and alcohol and how it can hurt you. I um, mean, they do that at the junior high, too. So it's important that we keep reminding the students that to make good choices. Now, how similar is your programs to the programs in other high schools? Different schools have, some of them are volunteer, some of them are starting to become um, mandatory. For a long time, though, the schools didn't have mandatory drug testing because um, there was a lawsuit, and it, it, it had um, prevented the schools from doing that. But it seems to be swinging the other way, where we're starting to schools are starting to have more mandatory drug testing programs. Maureen, this responsibility that you have uh, for these young people. Uh, it goes beyond just just drugs. It, it's it's life. Oh, These absolutely. people are facing life for the first time. You and I had a conversation a couple of minutes ago about about a situation uh, nationally where yes. uh, a lot of news coverage of police actions and and uh, who was right and who was wrong. And uh, you shared with me a really interesting effort that you that the school had made to kind of help students guide them through these right. kind of right. news events right. that affect their life. Right. Share with us uh, what you've done. Well, we have a school resource officer this year. We have two of them, actually, which we're very, very fortunate to have. And, um, it, well, we have three at the high school, and then we have some substitute school resource officers at the junior high and at the senior high. And sometimes they'll go into classrooms and talk about um, talk to the students about certain situations. And this is one of those situations. He is the one gentleman that I'm referring to at the high school. He is a retired state police officer. So he went into social studies classes and kind of gave the police officer's perspective. And that it, it was a good thing. And it made the students think and about how to look at the situation a little bit differently. So. Wow, that's wonderful. So, so it's really a broad spectrum of the teaching and the and the right. getting people prepared to make their own decisions. Well, it is because with students, and I say this, if students aren't, um, you know, m like mentally okay, they aren't um, clean from drugs and alcohol. 
that's what's most concern is the most important thing to us because you can't do academics I mean you know you need to be okay emotionally okay you need to be making good decisions before you know academics come into play tell us you said you'd been there for six years in the school district mm -hmm. tell us a little about yourself and, and what your history is that, that that makes you so passionate about this? Well, I was an English teacher, but through that, my master's is also in counseling, and I used to do adolescent and family therapy. Wow. And then, um, so I learned a lot with that, working with drugs and alcohol, and also just, just the mental health aspect of things. Um, then I was, I taught at Williamsburg, and I was the high school principal there for eight and a half years, and then I came to Hollidaysburg. Okay, and you, is your family? Yes, um, my husband and I live in Hollidaysburg School District, and we have two little boys, and they're at foot of ten in second and third grade. Oh, wow. So my um, third grader, when last year, um, was introduced to Sandy, and, and he brought home his book with Homer and told us all about it. <laughs> so it's definitely a wonderful program. Oh, it really is. So yes, fantastic. it would be great if people gave to that. That's wonderful. Oh, that is wonderful. And, and you know, you got to feel so good about what you're doing for these young people to try and help them stay uh, clean and sober. It's it's really important. It really is. And it's a good feeling when you feel that you've done something to impact a child. And it is one child at a time. You know, there are days go by where you, may, you don't see everybody, but um, we definitely deal with them on an individual basis. And it's important. Communication with the parents. It's, it's just really important because their mental health um, is what's most important before you can even think about academics. I'm really proud to have an opportunity to say hello to you and to meet you. Thank I, you. This and, has been great. Uh, and like I said, the school district itself has such a wonderful reputation. It's a great school district, yes. And, and uh, I can see why. I thank you very much for your time. Okay. What a pleasure. Thank, thank you, Dean. Thank you. Operation Our Town's mission, facilitate partnerships between the community and business to fight drug use and crime through proven law enforcement, treatment, and prevention techniques. The Gloria Gates Memorial Foundation, our, our main goal is to try to break the cycle of poverty. And, and in order to do that, we have to address the factors that are involved in poverty. Because of strong financial support from area business and an energized effort from citizens in our community, Operation Our Town has made a positive impact in our neighborhoods. I've seen the results. That just made it a no-brainer as far as me wanting to be involved and, and involving our business in it as well. A lot has been accomplished, but is the fight over? Of course not. If we didn't have an Operation Our Town, then some of these programs wouldn't exist. Really, it helps change some lives. Welcome back. We're joined now by Molly Rimback, and, and Molly is with the Blair County Juvenile Drug Court. Is that correct? That's correct. I'm the supervisor of the Blair County Juvenile Drug Court program, and um, I am a supervisor at the Juvenile Probation Office, and specifically the drug court program is run by Elizabeth Doyle. So we just talked to uh, Sandy and Maureen about prevention and education, and now if they haven't read the book and they haven't followed the rules, they got you. That's correct. And, and tell me what happens. Well, how, how long, is this a, a something new, the Juvenile Drug Court? The Juvenile Drug Court began in 2009, um, and it was implemented then as far as an effort to um, shed individuals who are um, suffering from addiction or using and abusing substances away from the regular court process and provide more of intensive supervision and treatment to those individuals suffering from addiction. Okay. And, and this was started by the, the judges? This was started, um, actually it, it was started efforts across the nation um, to, to get individuals away from punitive sanctions to be rehabilitated. Um, and within Blair County, um, a treatment team make, w was decided that um, it was most beneficial for us to go forth with implementing a drug court program for our adolescents. Okay, now Molly, uh, is it working? I mean, that's the obvious question. Is it working? Is it working? Um, if we save the life of one child, I would say it's working. Um, but I would agree. 
Our success rates are high. Um, we have 42 juveniles who have successfully graduated from the drug court program, and we have other individuals who have stepped down um, from the intensive supervision back into a regular probation. Folks, I, most of us really don't understand this this drug culture thing and, and the process. I mean, regardless of what the headlines say, uh, the, I don't think the majority of the people really experience the drug, the culture. And uh, I hear what Molly's saying, and I just recently talked to a young man and realized that uh, it's just not about like you get caught and you get plunished and then you've got to come back and make your way back into mm -hmm. society. And this is a young man with a college degree that can't get a job at minimum wage because of his drug history. And he's frustrated and, and uh, I, I, you know, you keep your fingers crossed that they don't relapse and go back, but this is an important role you play. It, it, tell me what, exactly what does the supervisor of the drug court do? Are you like the, are, are you like the Raymond Bird? Are you Ironside or something? You, well, I supervise two probation officers who work directly um, in the juvenile drug court program. They are the ones who are out in the field. They are the ones supervising um, the youth. They are the ones drug testing the youth. As far as a supervisor, I ensure that they're doing their jobs. Um, but I can tell you, as far as my background is, I started um, in probation as a victim advocate. And I work with victims of juvenile crime. And many people think, you know, how many victims could there be of juvenile crime? And juvenile crime, there are many, because most juvenile crimes are property crimes or personal crimes, and they involve a lot of individuals. Um, I moved on to um, become a role as a juvenile probation officer, and then in 2009 became, um, with my partner, Kathy Dickinson, we became the first two drug court officers in Blair County, and then I moved up from there. That's wonderful. Do you have a family? I have a husband and two dogs. <laughs> Are the dogs on drugs? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That's wonderful. And I tell you, I, would, I will say this. <clears throat> if I had broken the law, I would rather face you than my mother. Uh, you have a nice smiling face and, and you look very, very benevolent. My mother wasn't that well, benevolent. Dean, I don't know about that. I mean, <laughs> um, uh, we, I could appear very nice and very calm and very personable, but there's another side that, you know, as far as our role as probation officers within the state, we've moved from law enforcement officers and punitive um, sanctions for juveniles to moving to treatment and rehabilitation. And now we're focusing on evidence and the use of evidence-based programs to help juveniles become successful. And there is that always that tool in the toolbox, that punitive sanction that you could use on juveniles who just are not getting it. And, and, and we need that too. Mm -hmm. We need that too. Now tell me, uh, is, does this drug court have, they have like sessions or is it, it operates all the time? The juvenile drug court is um, an intensive treatment program that you appear before um, Judge Elizabeth Doyle on a bi-weekly basis and it usually occurs after hours so after hours when the courthouse closes and when juveniles are out of school so we okay. don't really want to interfere with juveniles in their education and this a, a juvenile probation officer sees the clients who are in drug court on a more frequent basis than regular probation. Can you share some numbers with us? Uh, how many people would be going through this program at one time? Currently there are 13 juveniles in drug court um, and we've had 42 graduate successfully. So it sounds to me like this program isn't for everybody. This is a program for people that qualify for rehabilitation. That's correct. Um, the, the eligibility for the program is individuals between the ages of 12 and 18 who have committed um, a crime, a misdemeanor, or a felony. We do not take violent offenders. We do not take sexual offenders or individuals who have committed a crime um, with a weapon. Okay, so uh, you must feel good about this. I'm very passionate about juvenile probation. I'm passionate about um, these children are our future and we have to help anyone. Um, I can talk about one client in specific. Um, 
he now he went through the drug court program he was an individual who was on the street and his drug of choice was cough and cold medication which is not illegal it's legal but when you continuously drink cough and cold medication you do impairment to your body and this young man could not um, get away from drinking cough and cold meds and so we did place him in a, a treatment facility and he came back to the community he is now married he has a child he has a full-time job as a supervisor of a local um, business and you know you, it's not just helping that child it's helping the generations ahead Wow. You know, we've heard so much. We talk about how these, these it touches the whole family. Correct. You know, we've heard from grandparents whose, whose grandchildren would steal their drugs that they needed to, for their own health, and, and these young people would steal their drugs, and, and we've done programs on that. We, we had uh, Bill Thompson from Thompson's Pharmacy on recently, and, and he mentioned just that products that they now have to keep behind the counter that aren't necessarily like marijuana or yeah. heroin but that people use them to to alter their uh whew, how boring does your life have to be to drink cough medicine i i'm, I'm sorry mm -hmm. I, it's hard for me to understand can you understand why people get hooked on these things it, it's the feeling they get Many juveniles, they, they're, this is a time of adolescence where they're experimenting. They're, they're trying to determine who they are, their identity. And many of these individuals, either they have a poor home life or they just need something to cope with their emotions. Their mental health may be off. They may be suffering from um, you know, depression or going through a rough time in their life and they turn to, to drugs to help them cope. A lot of pressures today, aren't there? There's a lot of pressure. We, we often talk, my generation often talks about that, that, that we, we did live pretty simple lives. Mm -hmm. We weren't influenced by a lot of things that these young people, I mean, you listen to the news in the morning, sometimes I want to take some cough medicine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, you know, but we have enough wisdom and experience to say, right. hey, you know, been here, done that. But if you're a young person and you hear about the terrible job market and you hear about all these things going on and and the cost of college and mm -hmm. and I guess you could feel overwhelmed. Very much so. You could be overwhelmed. You could be, you know, a lot of people come from lower income and they don't have um, cell phones. They don't. They can't afford, you know, these new technology, these new devices, and and it and it. It's pressure because friends have them and peers have them. Tears your heart out, doesn't Correct. it? Correct. You know, of all the stigmas, the economic stigma has to be the toughest when when mm -hmm. children, young people, just are left out of society because they can't afford what the in group has. And and uh, but there's also a lot of the in group that get on involved in these things. That is correct, and there's a lot of um, most people think it's single family parents, and that is not true. Um, you know, addiction touches everyone, whether they're your lower income or or you make you're, you're very affluent. I mean, it touches everyone. How long have you been doing this, working with youth in this capacity? Not necessarily this job, but your total involvement. I've been um, working as a probation officer for six years. That's wonderful. Did you mm -hmm. do anything before that, or I mean, I was a victim advocate working with victims. So you of were crime. still in that. Correct. So how much total time? Twelve years. Twelve years. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. Thank you. From 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 <laughs> the old people in our society, uh, thank you. It's uh, you know it's in, it's heartwarming to hear stories like this of people that have dedicated their lives to helping other people. I'm sure there's jobs that pay more. I'm sure there's jobs that might have better benefits. But I can't think of a better benefit than having somebody say, thank you, you changed my life. Mm -hmm. That's special. Molly, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been great talking to you. We're going to come back in a moment, folks, with all of our guests. And we're going to, we're going to have a nice discussion. Come on back and join us. If we can get the kids to do well in school, then they have a much better chance of staying out of trouble, stay away from drugs and crime, and then of course going on to higher education and, and then a good job.
Operation Our Town's efforts are designed to help strengthen existing organizations within our community so that they may serve and accomplish more. Our future depends on prevention. And we believe we can uh, change, break those cycles to where these kids have a, have a shot at living a, a normal, healthy, healthy, happy lifestyle. Our desire and our purpose here at Joshua House is to help see kids um, move from where they're at to really what they're supposed to do in life. What the Gloria Gates Memorial Foundation does now is helps kids stay out of trouble and reach their potential. Welcome back. Look at these smiling faces <laughs> I'm surrounded by. Welcome back, Sandy Smith from the Home Run Against Drugs and Maureen Lecter from the Juvenile Drug Court and in uh, Molly Rimback from Blair County Drug Court. And did I not read you guys were just given some award or something? That's correct. Um, Blair County Juvenile Drug Court was nominated and accepted an award in Harrisburg for, by the Juvenile Court Judges Commission for Program Court Operator Program of the Year. Um, so we accepted the award in November. Wow, that's and this is like from the whole state. You were number one from the whole state. Um, we were nominated, and they were court-operated programs. So that could be other drug courts. It could be other programs run run by the courts. But um, as far as Blair County, we brought home the award for the court-operated program of the year. Now, what do you think made your program so outstanding? What what single thing? I think it's a it's a combination of many things. It's a combination of our statistics about kids graduating from the program. It's about helping kids. Um, kids who are in the program are not only working on reducing their drug use and, and basically um, abstaining from drugs, they're also working on education, they're working on counseling with their family and counseling individually. So it's a, a multitude of things. You know, it's also a multitude of organizations and people, isn't it? I mean, you know, Operation Our Town, we think about drugs, but it also acts as an umbrella for several different organizations that kind of share this concern. And so we have law enforcement, and we have judges, and we have people working in probation departments, and, and, and all through the system, working together, not competing, working together to, to make it better. Congratulations, that's wonderful. Thank you. Did, did, was there any cash involved? <laughs> no, it was a plaque. Oh, <laughs> um, so it was I, a plaque and a state <laughs> recognition by other individuals. I had to ask because I was getting hungry. <laughs> I thought you could buy us lunch or something. <laughs> and, and tell me, uh, uh, Maureen, do, do you have some programs like that at your at your school? At the senior high, we do have a student organization called TAD, because we're the Holidaysburg Tigers. It's Tigers Against Alcohol and Other Drugs. And they're a pretty active organization, and most of those students that are in that are also in the Avedum, um group, which Avedum stands for I, I Have Your Back, which is an anti-suicide group. So those two usually go hand in hand when they do certain events and programs. Wow. So, you know, I, I just hadn't thought much about that, but we do have young people who are yes. so depressed that they yes. become suicidal, and, and uh, th that's wonderful. It is. It it's, is, and it's a really it's a, those organizations really have grown recently, um, which is a positive. I feel and great kids and and students from you know all different groups. It's not just if you would think of a specific group of students, but from all different gra backgrounds and all different groups. So that's nice to see they all come together for the same cause. You know, it makes you proud. Oh, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, my address is Holidaysburg, and, and so you know, I'm proud that our schools are doing those kind of things, and and it's, it makes me feel good that young people are, have something they can hang on to besides the bad stuff. We have. We just really have great students. I mean, in all the districts, it is amazing. And there, there's so many talents. Like when you go to the plays or the concerts or the athletic fields or just even walking in the classroom, young people have just so many talents. And if you can just tap into them, it's amazing. Each and every one of them have some sort of talent somewhere. And, but and they are. They blow my mind every day. Just and this social amazing. media gives them an mm -hmm. opportunity to share and, and get mm -hmm. involved in like, things. That mm -hmm. If you want to do it right, there's certainly opportunities out there. Yes, it can be positive, although social media 
has its negatives yeah, too, but well, it definitely can be positive, yes. I don't know, I'm still trying to use Facebook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the problem is nobody wants to see my face, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Sandy, tell me about your, tell me about your, what you're doing, and, and if you could, if you could do one thing to make it better, what would you do to make it better out there? I'm sorry. Uh, and if you're out talking to these young people, we talked about resources, that certainly finances is, is one of the, but if you could reach out and, and change anything that might make it better for, to, more able to get to these young people, uh, what would you do? Um, I might uh, try and expand my program to additional school districts. Right now it's kind of tough because I do raise all the money myself and I am coordinating the program and making all the books. Um, but if I could, I, I would like to be able to expand it into other schools. That's wonderful. And you've heard what we said, folks. You can help. You don't have to wait for somebody else to do it. You can help. Uh, just reach out and, and, like I said, call Operation Our Town, and, and Shauna can, can get you in the right direction and, and we'll do what we can to help you. And, and, uh, because it's a viable, at that age group, they're very susceptible to new ideas and thought processes. One of the things that I like to talk to the uh, students in the assembly program is how important it is to become involved. As they grow older, they'll have more opportunities to get involved in things in school. That not only athletics, but there are other things, there are other outlets like music and art and drama. You know, there are so many things that they can get involved uh, with. And, and, and uh, uh, Maureen, isn't funding getting cut back for some of these programs? It's yes. tough to fund these programs, right? Yes, it really is. And it's falling a lot of them on the parents. Um, because obviously, you know, we're, we're getting our state funding cut back, all school districts are, but yet we have a lot more unfunded mandates, whether it's testing or whatever the case is, they're not funded, but we have to implement have them. To implement them. And so it, it is a lot of the um, trips that different clubs take, it's falling on the students and the parents to raise the money, which is, um, un you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but I will say, that most of the student groups, parent groups, booster organizations, whether it's for an activity or athletics, no matter what, they are really good at supporting one another and stepping up. If somebody's involved that maybe doesn't have the financial uh, ability to, because there, there, you know, there are people out there. You know what the economy is like right now, and not everybody can just write a check to so their child can go somewhere. So everybody's willing to, to step up and help each other out, so that's nice. You know, I, I was gonna form a group called GBC, Grandparents Bring Cash, <laughs> because uh, it doesn't have to be just for the parents. I mean, my wife and I never had any children. Mm -hmm. And so we've had some wonderful opportunities to, to reach out and help someone that we thought needed a little special contribution to to participate or to do things and and you know what it made us feel good but it's nice that you and your wife are willing to do well, that that's wonderful and I think a lot of people are willing to do that yes. folks you know you look around you you got neighbors you got neighbors children you got things they're involved in and, and things they want to do and Maybe the next time somebody comes knocking on your door selling cookies or or asking for a contribution for something at the school, uh, maybe you should, instead of giving them a dollar, maybe you should give them five dollars. Uh, uh, these kids need your help. And most they, people are very, very good, very wonderful, and very generous. Uh, You're uh, right. You're grandparents right. bring cash. I like it. You know, we, I have to tell my dad. We're too fat to <laughs> hug anymore. So we just reach out and give you the dollars. There we and, go. And that makes it. Good. But we still a kiss in the cheek really helps sometimes. That's great. Molly, if you could change, if you could do anything that you think would enhance the programs that you're in, what, what would it be? I think the con community connectiveness. I think that kids need to be involved in their community, and and most individuals feel that these adolescents they're 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 bad people. They've committed a crime. They're 
they're you know violent and and that's not true um, we have young people who are making poor decisions and then they need help and, and I think getting the community on board understanding that these adolescents aren't aren't the super predators out there and they they need that surrounded connectiveness and support to succeed mm -hmm. Marianne, you, you see it from the school districts. Uh, you, you under a lot of pressures. If you, if you could, if you had the magic power to change something, what, what would it be? Well, I think that that's um, you know what Sandy say is very true. Um, but also with our communities, because they're so small, we are very lucky because we like in Hollidaysburg, we have a lot of community events. You know, light up night. Um, you know, the Y does a lot of different things, which brings the school and the community together, the young and the old together, and that's huge. I agree that people need to understand, sometimes children better, that it's really just amazing that some kids walk through the door of the school every day. It's really just absolutely phenomenal that they show up oh. because maybe what they had to deal with the night before or that morning um, something that some of us can't even imagine and most certainly something that's some things that some of us have never experienced so I think helping people understand that um, and letting kids know that we get that like we may we don't know how they feel most certainly um, but we most we're going to do everything we can to try to understand how they feel and help them get through those things because that's that's more important that they're okay. Wow, that's wonderful, Molly. Uh, you know, you you talk to these young people; they must tell you stories about how did you get hooked, how did this get started, what what do we have to do to to can, to discourage young people from making that choice uh, what as a society is there anything we can do that we're not doing now I think it starts early I, I Sandy's program um, was the first that I heard of today and it starts early um, seven years old I, I we have one child who's in our program who got addicted to drugs at seven and he started using IV heroin at 12 Oh my. Uh, so it starts early, starting early in the schools, starting early with the community, um, getting everyone on board as far as prevention efforts early. Now, Sandy, when she says, it, it, do you ever see any young people in your programs that you think, boy, this kid's at risk? I'm sure there are quite a few children that are at risk in the programs. Um, one thing that we like to stress in our program is the importance of having goals, what goals are and the importance of having goals. Uh -huh. And I think that that's a protective factor, you know, having, um, having things to look forward to, having things to work toward. And I always tell the kids, you know, goals take a lot of hard work, mm -hmm. but not to give up, to, to keep pressing on. And so I think it's really important that they, they have that. You know, I I keep reading, I keep reading articles in the newspaper, and I, and I hear things on the on the television and the radio news about uh, the consistency of our neighborhoods have changed. Uh, just about a year ago, I heard this story about the number of uh, students in the in the Altoona area school district who were homeless. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't remember hearing about homeless people in our area. I mean, let's face it, folks. We're not New York City. We know who's next door. We know the people around us, hopefully. And yet, we have homeless children. And, and now we have a backpack program to, to provide them with needy things. They're wonderful programs, but we need to do more. We need to find out what the, why these people are homeless and, and what we can do to help them. You, you must see that in, in the school district, Maureen. Yes. We just had actually the local representative from Harrisburg come and speak to us at Administrative Council about the homeless and the definition of it and the different um, steps that we need to take. But we do see that. We do people being in, ho even if they're in hotels, they're considered homeless, or if they're misplaced with another family. But yes, you'd be amazed the number of students, 
even in Blair County alone that they had last year that were homeless. So that's interesting. So the definition of homeless has changed. These aren't necessarily children that are sleeping under the bridge. That's correct. That's uh, correct. So who would be considered homeless if they were in a hotel? Or? If they were in a hotel or if they were with um, a, another family, had to, to just kind of had a temporary housing. Um, if they're in a shelter, they're considered homeless. So, or unfortunately, if they're on the street or living in their car, they're considered homeless. Wow. Is this a contributing factor, Molly? I think it's more recent now with the homelessness of, of individuals. It's more recent um, in our area. It's not a thing during your time, but recently it has popped up. We've had individuals who are on probation that were homeless. Um, we've had individuals stealing for food. That's, uh, now, you mentioned that Operation Our Town really hadn't participated financially with your group. Uh, has Operation Our Town been involved with your group? Operation Our Town has been, uh, we've been truly blessed to have started the program and have gotten grants every year of running the program. And Operation Our Town contributes to giving our um, participants incentives. Um, what incentives are, are basically tokens that, you know, you were clean for two weeks, here's an individual reward for being clean. It keeps kids motivated. It, it basically hones in on that behavior um, as something that they didn't do and now they're doing and we reward them for, for what they're doing. Wow. Whose idea was that? Um, it, it's if you look at the Go ahead evidence, and take credit for it, Molly. I'm not it was your idea, was it? <laughs> no, if you look at the evidence, if you look at research and evidence, it says that you know you should give four affirmations to one um, consequence or, or one um, sanction, and that you should, you know, use some type of motivation to change a behavior. I mean, I, I say to our audience, I continually am amazed at that this organization created locally administered locally by local business people basically who have other things on them you know they've got businesses to run and things to do and yet somebody come up with the idea that we need to do incentives because it works and and I'll tell you folks that's so impressive that our neighbors are like that and uh, you know, Maureen, how about how about out at, at, at your school? Do they have any incentive programs or things that, that work? Well, we have, we're implementing this district wide. Um, they're called Tiger Stripes. It's a school wide positive behavior support program. Oh. And we are the only high school in the IU, uh, in IU 8, that has it. Um, it started at the junior high at Holidaysburg. And this year it was implemented into two elementary, or one elementary in the high school. And um, next year it will be district wide because it'll be in the other two elementaries. And you do reward students for doing things that we want them to do. And that they like holding the door for somebody, um, getting their homework done. And it's not all the time, but you give them what are called tiger stripes. And um, then depending on obviously the age of the student, they can turn those in for numerous things, whether it would be to get first in line at lunch for the junior high students, because that's a big deal at junior high, yeah. or um, eat outside, or we have, uh, all the teams have different bigger programs throughout the year, like get out of class to watch a movie. Um, you know, things that the students want to do. Right now, we're preparing, um, we're having a pep rally and they're going to do a tailgate before the pep rally and students can turn in so many stripes. So that's an ins one incentive program um, that we uh, trying to get the students to do the right thing. Maureen, that's wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard three dedicated people telling you and sharing their stories about what they're doing to make our neighborhood safer our children have a better future and our lives better altogether. Operation Our Town is a very special thing. It needs your help, it needs your support, and with people like this working within the programs, we're going to win this battle. It's, it's up to us, but we're going to win. Folks, have a great day. Thank you for joining us. See you again.